The history of non-Euclidean geometry begins with the history of geometry itself. When the Greek mathematician Euclid wrote his elements around the year 300 BC, he began by writing five postulates, or statements so rational that they did not need explanation. These were, one, there exists through point P and Q a unique line L. Two, there exist line segments AB and CD and point E, where E is between A and B, and CD is congruent to AB. Three, for points A and O, there exists a circle with a center zero and a radius OA. Four, right angles are congruent. And five, for a line L and a point P not on L, there exists a unique line M through P that is parallel to L. Number five, all logical at first, poses several difficulties on closer observation. Unlike the first four, it cannot be proven visually. We cannot actually ever see if the two lines in fact do intersect. Therefore, over the next two millennia, mathematicians set out to prove the fifth postulate by using the first four. Relatively little progress was up until the 18th and 19th centuries. Around this time, mathematicians instead began to consider the possibility that the postulate was false. Once this assumption was made, two entirely new systems of geometry emerged as a result of their findings. Mathematicians experimented with the assumption that there were more than one parallel line to line L through the given point. This became hyperbolic geometry, while other mathematicians assumed the opposite. Parallel lines do not exist. This is spherical geometry. It is self-evident that nothing concerning art is self-evident anymore. Not its inner life, not its relation to the world, not even its right to exist. The forfeiture of what could be done spontaneously or unproblematically has not been compensated for by the open infinitude of new possibilities that reflection confronts. In many regards, expansion appears as contraction. The sea of the formerly inconceivable, on which around 1910 revolutionary art movements set out, did not bestow the promised happiness of adventure. Instead, the process that has unleashed consumed the categories in the name of that for which it was undertaken. More was constantly pulled into the vortex of the newly taboo. Everywhere artists rejoiced less over the newly won realm of freedom than that they immediately sought once again after ostensible yet scarcely adequate order. For absolute freedom in art, always limited to a particular, comes into contradiction with the perennial unfreedom of the whole. In it, the place of art became uncertain. The autonomy it achieved, after having freed itself from cultic function and its images, was nourished by the idea of humanity. As society became ever less a human one, this autonomy was shattered. Drawn from the ideal of humanity, art's constituent elements withered by art's own law of movement. Yet art's autonomy remains irrevocable. All efforts to restore art by giving it a social function, of which art is itself uncertain and by which it expresses its own uncertainty, are doomed. Indeed, art's autonomy shows signs of blindness. Blindness was ever an aspect of art. 
In the age of art's emancipation, however, this blindness has begun to predominate in spite of, if not because of, art's lost naivete, which, as Hegel already perceived, art cannot undo. This binds art to a naivete of a second order, the uncertainty over what purpose it serves. It is uncertain whether art is still possible, whether, with its complete emancipation, it did not sever its own preconditions. This question is kindled by art's own past. Artworks detach themselves from the empirical world and bring forth another world, one opposed to the empirical world as if this other world too were an autonomous entity. Thus, however tragic they appear, artworks tend a priori toward affirmation. The clichés of art's reconciling glow enfolding the world are repugnant not only because they parody the emphatic concept of art with its bourgeois version and class it among those Sunday institutions that provide solace. These clichés rub against the wound that art itself bears. As a result of its inevitable withdrawal from theology, from the unqualified claim to the truth of salvation, a secularization without which art would never have developed, art is condemned to provide the world as it exists with a consolation that, shorn of any hope of a world beyond, strengthens the spell of that from which the autonomy of art wants to free itself. The principle of autonomy is itself suspect of giving consolation. By undertaking to posit totality out of itself, whole and self-encompassing, this image is transferred to the world in which art exists and that engenders it. 